Great. How are you doing today? Okay, thanks. And yourself? Very good. I really appreciate you taking the time. Really, thank you. <laughs> so I know you only have about an hour. So if you're comfortable, we can go yeah. ahead and just jump right into it. Great. Cool. So uh, as we talked about in our brief correspondence, what kind of brought this about is that I came across your new book, Geography is Destiny. And it goes without saying that I absolutely loved it. Um, <laughs> and it had, it, I had a lot to, lot to think about. So I just think for anybody who may end up watching this and also just to reinforce my own understanding, if you could just give a brief overview from your own mind and talk about some of the main points you're arguing. Yeah, well, I mean, I decided to write this book because um, I'd started off my career as an archaeologist and historian working like most of us do in one particular time and place. And then, but I'd found kind of as my career went on that often I could see nuances to the questions I was asking about one particular time and place by um, kind of broadening out the spatial and chronological framework, you know, looking at bigger areas over longer periods of time. Until eventually I got to the point where um, I was feeling that what I was really interested in was not generating new answers to questions about particular times and places by looking at larger things, but the larger things in themselves were what were interesting. And I was moving toward kind of trying to theorize about what drove history in the long run, how, how the world changed a global scale, these kinds of things. But um, in the back of my mind the whole time, uh, it's like this little voice kept nagging at me saying, of course, the, the historian voice saying, of course, actual history is made by real people in real places. And all these grand theories, not much help if you can't apply them to explaining specific things. And so when the British voters decided in 2016 to leave the European Union. I, I'd been thinking for a while, you know, I should try to write a book that brings the grand theories down to a more particular scale, talk about one specific thing. And so the British decided to do this. And I think, aha, this is like a perfect test case um, that would allow me to do what I've been setting out to do. So I sort of asked myself, well, do these theories focusing on geography and the impact of large material forces on everyday decisions, do they actually help us understand what happened in June of 2016 in Britain? And you know, obviously I came to the conclusion, yes, they do. Otherwise I wouldn't have had a book to write. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, so the, the book is basically an attempt to, for me to sort of figure out um, what how does that decision fit into this longer term British history and uh, you know obviously a huge variety of things have gone on in 10,000 years of British history but it, it did seem to me that it came down to a geographically driven story with three fairly simple phases in this story and the first of them dominates almost the whole of the story 95% like of the story because you know 10,000 years ago up to just 500 years ago where um for all intents and purposes, the British Isles are still, in fact, part of the European mainland. That the English Channel is more of a highway than a barrier. The Atlantic Ocean is a barrier, not a highway. And Britain, is this group of islands um, connected to the continent, more or less, um, where everything that gets invented, all the new big ideas and so on on the continent, end up eventually reaching the British Isles. Um, like English history, because England is the part nearest the continent, English history is about dealing with what comes its way from the continent. Scottish, Welsh and Irish history about dealing with what comes their way from England. You know, many variations on that theme, but that kind of is it until about 500 years ago. And at that point, the geography is continuing to drive the history, but geography starts to take on new meanings. And the, the, the way these meanings of geography change, I think throughout the whole story, they're driven by technology and organisation. And so the big new technological thing is ships that can stay at sea for long periods. It would allow you to close the English Channel and open the oceans. You can cross um, the Atlantic Ocean, connect to the rest of the world, close the English Channel, turn it into a barricade against people from the continent, shut Britain off from the European continent if you choose to do so. Mm -hmm. And so the second big thing in the change is organization that to, to do that you've got to have organizations able to raise enough money to pay to build these fleets and to keep them at sea for long periods and that's kind of where the trouble comes in because an organization can do that is one that can reach into your pocket and take your money to pay for all this stuff and a lot of people don't want that and um, 
Um, so there's intense resistance to this new vision of Britain as something outside of Europe, more connected to uh, the global um, systems. Um, and so the British go through like 200 years of civil wars, re religious reformations, all kind of stuff. But eventually they come down to this view, becomes dominant, that yes, Britain is more of a global force in the European one. And that's the way most of the people in the British Isles ultimately decide that they, they want it. Um, governments in London unite the whole of the British Isles behind this moat defensive that the channel has become. They create a, a global empire on which the sun never sets. And it sort of goes along not smoothly, but it goes along for a couple of hundred years uh, until about 1900. And by that point, the same forces of changing technology and organization, they're continuing to shrink the globe in such a way that now there's simply no way for the British Isles to remain at the top of a global system. And so resisting the big challenge that comes from the continent, from the German challenge, they're able to resist that, but only at the cost of subordinating themselves to the great mountain of money that's piled up in North America. And the big challenge now, it seems to me, is that the third great global pile of money is accumulating in East Asia. And the big question for the 21st century, it's not the one the British were asking themselves in the referendum of what do we do about Brussels? The real question is going to be, what do we do about Beijing? And I think that understanding that helps you put the whole Brexit thing into its proper historical perspective. Because I think the question historians are going to ask you know, 50, 100 years from now, it'll be, did the Brexit decision position the British better for dealing with a world increasingly dominated by China, or did it not? And that's going to be the only thing people really worry about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a ton there. And I actually want to break that down basically into sections. I have, I have several follow-up questions directly related to that. So thank you. The first is sort of, you mentioned how you're using Brexit sort of as a case study to apply a deep history of perspective to this, this sort of thinking. Do you feel this is something more uniquely applicable to Brexit? Or is this something that you think much of the West and in fact, the whole world could benefit from doing? Yeah, no, that's a, a good question. Because I think it is absolutely not a unique Brexit kind of thing. The, um, the, the entire planet is having to deal with the, the rise of the Chinese mountain of money. It, just like the whole planet had to deal with the American mountain of money. Yeah. Um, the 19th century and everything kind of becomes reoriented around that question and uh you look at if you look at the arguments leading up to the brexit vote um as a lot of people pointed out a lot of similarities between the discussions being had in britain and the discussions being had in the us in the the summer you know, before donald trump gets elected mm -hmm. similar kinds of things um on the table and like in both places membership of a larger political organization that in some ways conflicts with more traditional ideas about sovereignty and identity this is one of the big things so um, of the british of course it's it's the european union in the us it's nafta and um you know the attempts some people are making to have the us join um a new trade partnership embracing most of the pacific basin they're just mm. kind of oriented against china and so similar kinds of questions come up in both places. There's similar kinds of questions coming up all over the European continent. And actually the place um, I found where I think the questions maybe started to come up earliest was Australia. Because you know, mm -hmm. the Australians for a long time been part, well, first of a British, then of an American dominated economic and security system. And then over the last 15, 20 years, increasingly the Australians have realized, well, we're in this awkward position. We're part of an American run security arrangement and a lot of our identity ties are with the US now. And yet our primary economic partner is China. And so you're thinking about this as a strategist. What you are going to want to try to do is to avoid ever being pushed into a position where you have to make a choice between your primary strategic partner and your primary economic partner. And the Australians have gone through the, the torments of the dawn across the last 10 mm. years to avoid having to make that choice. It's just getting harder and harder and harder. And I think the same kind of choice is bearing down on everybody now. And do you think that this is a, a choice that has to be so binary? Is it a choice that has to be made or is it something that can be sort of kept at bay and ambiguous indefinitely? Yeah, well, now, now you're talking like a strategist. Yes, because <laughs> that's the goal. Don't sure. let it be a binary thing. Um, is that the minute people narrow down your, your, your range of manoeuvre, um, you're trapped, you're starting to lose the game. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, and I think you can see a lot of governments around the world trying desperately to avoid being boxed into a corner where they have to make a decision of this kind. Mm -hmm. But it's it's becoming increasingly difficult. And again, you know, as a historian, I do like to think about the always asking myself, you know, can we see analogies for this sort of thing in the past? And I think you know, what happened to the British 120, 140 years ago is actually not a bad, at least not a bad starting point. Because with the analogies, always there are so many differences in every case. But it's it can be quite a good starting point. But um, you know, the British have created this global system um, that they are at the top of it. And um, making it work depends very much on staying out of big European entanglements. Um, Britain's strategic goal for Europe is just to make sure that no single European power ever becomes so secure on the continent that it can start investing all its money in building up a fleet to challenge the British at sea. So the British get this reputation as perfidious Albion. They're all shifting their alliances. You just cannot trust these people because what they want to do is just make sure nobody gets too comfortable and powerful. And that gets progressively more and more difficult, especially after 1870, when um, the Prussians unite the whole of Germany. And Britain's like traditional way of thinking about continental strategy is, OK, our closest great power, biggest rival is France. What we always want to do is just annoy the French, make it difficult for them. And a great way to do that is to make alliances with different shifting constellations of German states, all these little mm -hmm. states in Germany, get groups of those together. So we're kind of encircling France, threatening it from the rear. Well, when Bismarck is able to unite Germany, that old strategy no longer really works because now you've got this superpower emerging in Germany. And for a while, the British are kind of juggling with maintaining close ties with Germany. Then it just starts to become too difficult. And they realize we've got to go through this massive strategic reorientation. We've got to do all the things we've been trying to avoid doing for 150 years, we've now got to start doing them. Having formal alliances um, with different countries, getting locked into an alliance system with France and Russia on the continent. France and Russia have been the traditional enemies. Now they become the traditional friends because the Germans are becoming such a problem. Um, and the bit that I think is most kind of illuminating though for the situation places like the US find themselves in now is how the British dealt with the Americans. Because it's like this never any public discussion really of what's going on but just quietly the british drift into an understanding with the americans and initially it goes all the way back actually to the monroe doctrine but initially it's that we will sort of stay out to your backyard and not give you trouble but then increasingly it's that you are going to police the, the americans are going to police the whole western hemisphere the british will agree to take a secondary position in that to not bother the Americans anymore, in fact, help the Americans when necessary, in return for the Americans quietly coming on side as uh, the great financial superpower that agrees to keep the British system going. If it gets really unpleasant, the Americans will keep us going through their financial markets. And no one ever really discusses this. It is sort of remarkable. And um, But the British have drifted so far in this direction by 1914 that, of course, they find themselves stuck in a war situation when that is and by almost unanimous agreement among the British leadership. That's the one thing they don't want is a global war. And yet here they are having to do it. That's what I think is the most potentially most informative analogy today for people. How do you avoid going down that path? Or is it sometimes just unavoidable? Sure, sure. And how do you conceive of China's intent? Are they trying to force that decision? Or is that something that they are comfortable leaving in this sort of ambiguous, amorphous state? Or are they trying to pin everyone down in one way or the other? Yeah, I think how China's approach has evolved in just the last few years has been just really amazing to watch. When I first started thinking and writing about China, this was back in the 2000s. I wrote a book called Why the West Rules for Now that came out in 2010. And when I started writing that, it was around about 2005, 2006. And this was at the height of this attitude in the West that... Um, China joining the World Trade Organization and becoming a major trading partner, especially for the US, this was an unambiguous good thing. And that George W. Bush, when he's president, he has this line he uses repeatedly. He says, trade with China and time is on our side. Mm -hmm. And there's this assumption that most people are making that in order to be a prosperous global trading community like China wants to be, you've got to become more like the West. You've got to liberalize your institutions. 
internally and work with American dominated external institutions like the World Trade Organization and the World Bank and the IMF and so on. That this is just that this is the only way you can do this. And there are some signs that that maybe is happening in China in the 2000s. And certainly look at the rest of East Asia. You look at places like South Korea, Taiwan, um, these of Singapore, these at one time, all of these were pretty nasty one party states, very invested mm-hmm. regimes. All of them opened up and became much more democratic and became much richer in, in uh, the course of doing that. But China has gone down a different path. I think particularly since the 2008 financial crisis, Chinese leaders have started to say, um, we no longer have to accommodate ourselves to American dominated institutions. We are willing to be a lot tougher now than we were before and in you know, really across the board all kinds of ways and they have i think the chinese have started pushing other governments toward having to make a decision which um i know to, to me it seems like that's just a very bad move that china has done so well out of this ambiguity this ability to let people have their cake and eat it um now though they're, they're making it much more difficult for other countries to do that i suspect this is a mistake and i think um well i mean everybody says this, and I'm sure they're right, that um, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine is probably giving leaders in Beijing a lot of lost sleep uh, over this, because this is illustrating just how badly it can go wrong if you force people who are potentially your rivals, if you force them to make a decision over who are their friends. This isn't necessarily going to go the way you want. Sure, but how much do you think in reality it will change their... Uh, actions moving forward because you know they've said for a long time now and they've grown especially with Xi Jinping has grown more with more conviction said that by the 100 year anniversary of the CCP we will have reunified China we will have taken Taiwan and it seems like even with the invasion in Ukraine they're still moving towards doubling down on this and this won't happen in 2045 it will happen you know conservatively a few years before that point so we are on the horizon of that finally being realized or them carving out probably a pretty different path. Yes, I you know a lot of um, political analysts think that 2027 is like uh, it's sort of wow. the, the point at which this is likely to happen. There are a number of reasons, but one of them being um, kind of the, the current uh, wave of military reorganization and modernization of the Chinese armed forces. And if it hasn't, if Taiwan hasn't reunited with the mainland by 2027, then we should expect to see some kind of military action at that point, which is a very scary thought. Um, as again, you know, the US has done so well for such a long time by being so infuriating and about about Taiwan. Yeah. But it is, it is a very difficult strategic issue for the United States. And of course, it's much more than a difficult issue for the Taiwanese themselves. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah I think we probably do have to expect to see some rather alarming developments on the Taiwanese front in this decade. Um, I, like a lot of people, I mean, I hope that seeing how difficult this was, uh, invading Ukraine was for Vladimir Putin, is going to make the Chinese a little more cautious than they might have been about Mm. into anything there. But yeah, really scary, because it's just so very difficult to predict what might happen. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually a nice transition into one of the other big questions that I wanted to ask you is, uh, I guess, just to, to put it in a pretty straightforward manner. Do you think that the influence of geography is more or less dominant now than it has been in the past? Because on the other hand, I think there was a period of time where maybe that influence was shrinking with the improvements of different technologies. But after a certain point, it sort of begins to horse you back around. So what, what's your thought on that? Yeah, well, I mean, just just a few years ago, there were people who were saying that you know, geography, the, the meanings of geography have changed so much now that it basically doesn't have a meaning anymore. And if I mean, you and I were sitting here doing this thing by Zoom, I mean, you know, unimaginable. Yeah, wild, that, really. <laughs> optimistic to think we could do this. And, you know, you know um, 20, uh, 30 years ago, one of us would have had to have gone on an airplane. A hundred years ago, you know, <laughs> we'd have to get in a wagon and go over the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, clearly the people who say geography is losing its meaning. This is not ridiculous. They have a point here. Sure. And yet, um, obviously, geography has by no means entirely lost its meanings. And if you are born in Kinshasa, you know, your life chances are just so different than if you're born in like Philadelphia or Frankfurt or something. It clearly has a meaning there. 
and strategically, I think the meanings of geography have, have not gone away. And again, the sort of historical analogies, I think, are kind of useful for thinking about this too, because uh, if you want to find nice parallels with people talking about geography losing its meaning, you want to go back to about 1900, and um, particularly writers in Britain saying, yep, geography has lost its meaning. We have united the world in this global supply network to feed London, Brit British Isles, make it possible for the British to concentrate on coal-powered industry and on financial services in a way that we couldn't possibly do if we had to rely on the food grown in the British Isles. So geography has changed its meaning. And um, you even get people uh, like Norman Angel saying, um, change its meaning so much that great power war is unthinkable. And the, the in, economies are so intertwined that if a war broke out now between the major European powers, the global economy would melt down and they'd all have to stop fighting after a couple of weeks because they'd run out of money. And it, yeah, it turned out spectacularly wrong. Yeah. The, the historians of globalization often like to say we've had these two big phases of it in modern times, one from about the 1860s up to 1914, and then a period of deglobalization, then the creation of a new order starting in 1945, but particularly after 1989. And um, so what, what people who look at history that way will now tend to say, of course, is, well, now we're moving into a second great deglobalization as the political security tensions rise around the world. People are starting to talk about about you know, the security of their food supply and the security of their supply chains more generally, decoupling them from countries like China that are potentially rivals to us. Um, I think it'll be astonishing if one of the outcomes of Ukraine is not that China really beefs up its efforts to create a, a financial system that's independent of American financial systems. And our um, sanctions on Russia clearly haven't stopped um, Vladimir Putin, but they have really hurt and um, being able to, of course, Xi Jinping must be concerned about what the costs would be for China if it wholeheartedly got behind Russia. Um, and so a, a financial system that isn't so vulnerable to Western control, that's got to be really high on the list of priorities for Chinese leaders now. So, yeah, no, I'm sure you're right that we are some years now into a retreat of globalization. Although you know, my sense, of, <clears throat> based on a you know, really long-term view of history, say what is the, the big things that have been going on over the last 10, 100,000 years, globalization is one of the absolute big ones. And it goes up and down. Um, and I think we're in a down phase right now, but um, things will have to have drastically change their meanings if we don't go back into an up phase again after this. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to ask, is it seems like the people who challenge what I consider to be the inevitability of globalism, I'm just not sure what they expect moving far forward into the future, as if it might be at all practical to sort of just turtle within our own countries and have very strict limitations upon what we're doing in terms of migrating between countries and trading and so on. So do you think that this will just be like a bit of a, you know, perhaps a several decade downturn and then we'll inevitably return to the increasing globalization or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would say probably yes. Although I think I tend to be rather optimistic about all these things. Sure, sure. We'll work out. And of course, the, uh, the way I see the world, optimistic means globalization among other things, which of course it doesn't for a lot of people. Sure. Well, a lot of uh, my impression from talking to some of the people who've been involved in um, sort of make America great again kind of approach to the world is that a lot of the time, at least some of them, they're not worrying too much about. I mean, if you were to pitch the question to the world 50 or 60 years from now, don't you think we're going to be back on the trend toward globalization? Um, some of the people I've talked to would say, I couldn't care less because that is not my horizon on this. So, I'm primarily a politician, and uh, the problems of 60 years ago, those are the problems of two generations of politicians. Oh, they, they must solve them. What I care about is what's happening here and now. And um, the more cynical ones will say, well, you know, politically for me, it's a good thing to push this argument. Some will say, I, you know, and genuinely, I'm sure they're being sincere. I think it's the best thing for the American people or the British people or whatever right now to push these more nationally framed agendas. And so these longer term questions, that's all fine for the academics and the ivory towers to talk about this. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think there will be a swing back in the direction of globalization, and I don't think we're going to see a total meltdown of globalization. I don't think we're going to see it even meltdown on quite the scale it did um, during and after World War I, unless we do have another go at World War. 
but now with nuclear weapons. And that, I think, gives us the potential, potential to knock globalization off, um, off its track in such a way that it could be thousands of years before we come back. Yeah, that's it, it's really a terrifying thought. And again, when you start saying dates like 2027, and I mean, if there would be a flashpoint for that, it's very likely to be that. So considering yeah. where we are and what's to come, I'm sure reflecting on this conversation in a few years, one way or the other is going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I must say, I, again, I, I do tend to be reasonably optimistic about these things. I think, um, while I think Xi Jinping has made a mistake in pushing so hard to confront the American global order, the guy's not nuts. No, um, certainly think, not. Uh, yeah, uh, blowing up the whole world is not part of his plan, um, which is not to say it, it, it can't happen. I mean, mistakes mm -hmm. obviously are made, miscalculate. Um, almost, I think almost nobody involved in the events in August 1914 actually seriously wanted the kind of war that they got. So people do make terrible, terrible mistakes. But yeah, I remain reasonably optimistic that um, if anyone thinks they're getting anywhere near the, the nuclear threshold, they're going to dial it back. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, we'll go a little bit of a different direction because there's a whole other range of topics I'd love to, to pick your brain about. And one of them is, uh, as I told you, my background is in chemistry. So a lot of the things that I found interesting were some of the more technical details about how we've learned a lot of the things that we've learned using all these new techniques. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think most people are familiar with carbon dating and a lot of you know, similar techniques that have been at least around for a few decades at this point. But one example that I had never heard of or I'm just generally not familiar with is the uh, isotope analysis, for example, that was used to date the first or the first known people to migrate from the continent. And another example that stands out that what I don't believe was mentioned in the book was the recent just like confirmation of the uh, Viking presence in North America, which mm -hmm. they did using cosmic rays and so on. So my question is, is a bit more general, which is how much more do you expect that we have to learn about objects and places that we've already discovered through new technologies rather than extending the search for more? Yeah, I think a spectacular amount. Um, I think uh, there is probably almost no limits to what we're eventually going to be able to do. I mean, and the things we're doing now, like um, with the ancient DNA analysis, I mean, up till six or seven years ago, um, you were considered a bit goofy in archaeological circles if you thought that we were going to be able to sequence entire genomes, as opposed to what we had been doing was focusing on mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. Just, I'm sorry, you know, you passed down solely through the female line or the DNA on the Y chromosome passed down solely through the male line because you know, sexual reproduction merges the DNAs together, the, the two parents. And people always used to say, you know, hashing out, figuring out the whole genomes, that's like unscrambling an egg. You know, this is basically, this is kind of not going to happen. And then it does. <laughs> you get so much better at extracting the DNA from uh, ancient uh, carbon-based materials, and so much better at turning these tiny fragments, sort of inflating them up into entire stretches of the genome. I mean, it, we, what we're doing now is magic. I mean, it really is. Uh, like, you know, some of the um, more recent stuff from the, the caves in Central Asia where the Denisovans were found. We're extracting DNA from the dirt. We're not even having to get hold of bones to do it anymore. We can get your, because it was all those were shedding bits of skin all the time. Everything we do, we leave a disgusting trail. Oh, skin. <laughs> it's microscopic and we don't worry about it too much. We're able to get that stuff, 100,000 years old bits of somebody's skin out of the mud and sequence it up um, into their genomes. I mean, this is magic. So, um, I, I anticipate this going in directions that we can't even imagine what we're going to be able to do. And the, the thing, the most immediate thing on the threshold is, um, is cloning kinds of humans that don't exist anymore. And this, I mean, it still is a sort of theoretical possibility, but it's really, really close to the practical stage. And mm -hmm. very soon we're going to be confronting this question, or it will become an ethical question of, should we be doing that? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, one of my colleagues here at Stanford, um, who's a biological anthropologist, he says, you know, the, the big question is, you, know, you, you, you clone a Neanderthal, where are you going to put it? 
you going to send them to Harvard or are you going to put them in a zoo? What are you going to do with this? And I think that is going to be the, the burning ethical question. But I suspect we will relatively soon, in the space of decades, be in a position where we're able to sort of virtually clone. Um, you know, we will have sure. a, of a mapping of the human brain um, that we will be able to, to virtually generate a Neanderthal brain on, on computers and like run the thing, see what it does. Mm -hmm. um, which is not going to be quite the same as having a flesh and blood Neanderthal in front of you, but I, I suspect it'll get sufficiently close to that where the ethical problems will then be sidestepped. But, and then, of course, you get these deep philosophical problems. If you can generate a virtual Neanderthal brain, are you ever actually going to be able to understand that what it's like to be a Neanderthal? And yeah, philosophers of mind have been arguing about this for a hundred years. I mean, is it possible for someone with a Homo sapiens brain to actually grasp the experience of being one of these Neanderthals? So yeah, I think yes, yeah, stable isotope analysis. This is kid stuff. Um, yeah, this sure, is sure. <laughs> really the, the shallow end of the pool here. So do you think that that's? I've actually never I've never heard of something like that. Is there actually work currently being done to do this sort of virtually, or is this something that you just are anticipating? Yeah, this I think this is going to be a spin off of the larger and much more expensive project of scanning the human brain. And you know, there's things like the European Brain Project, all, mm. the, all these different people who are interested in um, uh, 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 scanning human brains down to the level of uh, the, the you know, individual electrical actions going on within the brain, and then um, being able to mount scans of actual brains onto hardware and, and basically replicate the human brain in a virtual context. And uh, a lot of people say, well, this, it's, you're never really going to be able to do that because so much of the, our mental activity, it's not just the electrical signals flashing back and forth in your brain. It's all the input into your brain from the chemicals that your body generates, the feedback between the two. And that's something that maybe you can't do virtually, although maybe you can. And so, yeah, and I think yeah, we are, the archaeologists, we're going to be like um, with the archaeology of climate change has become such a huge thing in the last few years. We are going to be catching the crumbs that fall from the table of the people who are studying this kind of in real time in the real world. And then you know, as their ability to scan brains and to model brain activity moves forward, then the archaeologists are going to be able to sort of glom onto that and plug in the kind of things that we're interested in. Sure. And I guess that's why, I mean, there are all sorts of new emerging fields, like I think they, they're being coined as paleoarchaeobotany, paleoarchaeochemistry, and so on. So I guess there will be a shift. I mean, even something like you just mentioned, uh, biological anthropology was probably niche at best a few decades ago. And so I guess the, that those will be growing departments at universities across the country. And it, Yes. Yeah. And actually, this is a, is a serious question for us, is for archaeologists, will be how we organize this sort of thing institutionally. Because we all have this problem that, you know, there's all these amazing sort of whiz-bang scientific developments that we can use. But on the whole, people in university departments have say, well, say, say one of the things which is come forward by leaps and bounds in the last 20 or so years has been residue analysis so taking ancient storage vessels and um, extracting the residues of what was stored in them and analyzing them chemically and we can do all these amazing things now but on the whole university chemists are not that interested in it because it's not pushing it's not answering the questions that are hot questions in chemistry departments and on the whole anthropologists are not that interested in it because it's not, I mean, anthropologists move much more to questions about identity and so on in the last 20, 30 years. And this sort of thing just isn't that interesting to them. And so it's become very hard for universities to actually hire the people doing the cutting edge archeological science work. So I think if, if we're gonna realize the full potential here, um, there, there's gonna to need to be some changes. I mean, I say with the DNA, the top people in, uh, ancient DNA, generally not in um, anthropology departments or archaeology programs. Um, they're like they're in genetics labs um, mm -hmm. here and on the European continent. Yeah, so I guess that's one of the things that's tough is you it requires quite the expertise in two pretty disparate fields. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. even if you have the expertise working on these projects, you also need to get funding and then therefore get the public and these other institutions interested in in providing that funding. So. Yeah, so yeah, we'll see where that, where that goes. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So yeah, uh, I'll move on to another different point, kind of jumping around a little bit. Uh, one thing, especially towards the beginning of the book that you emphasize regularly is how 
uh, Britain really only occupied this position as a great empire and a great power for, I think you say 3% of its total history, some, some, something on that order. So, yeah. yeah. So do you think that this is something, is, is this sort of a harmful delusion? Is this, is the fact that British identity is disproportionately constructed from this period of time, something that's to the detriment of Britain? Or do you think that it's, it's actually a useful construction to sort of cherry pick the period of time at which your country was best? Because, you know, another, a, a completely different example is thinking of uh, modern day Iranians. I mean, we, they, they still refer to themselves as Persians and they are digging back much farther. And they do so because that's the period in which the, uh, their people were powerful. So is, is that useful or a detriment? Yeah, well, again, really interesting question. And like most of these questions, I suspect it's a sort of yes or no uh, kind sorry, of answer. Um, that, uh, I mean, I say you know, it's a harmful, it's a bad thing in at least a couple of different ways. It definitely is a bad thing. One is that I do think with some of the Brexiteers in, in 2016 who are so keen to leave the European Union, they did have this idea a little bit in their minds. If we can just get free of all these infernal continental busybodies meddling in our business, the world will sort of default to where it was in the 18th century. And um, I mean, nobody would put it quite so crudely um, mm -hmm. and what the way they tended to talk about it was that you know, Britain will be able to free itself of all the regulations of the EU position itself as something you know, more like Singapore small government light in light taxes um, rapid you know e easy maneuver around the world um, but I think this idea was there that we will go back to where we were you know, in the days of Pitt the Elder if we just get free of these damn continentals which I think is delusional the world has just changed so much so many specific things have to be in place for this to be an option for the British in the 18th century. And those things are just not in place anymore. It's a little bit delusional to think that way. But the other way I think, which I think it's harmful is that there are a lot of people around the world, including a disproportionate number in Iran, who <laughs> look at it and say Britain is still that country. Britain is the little Satan as opposed to the American great Satan, who have this um, sense that the British are fundamentally untrustworthy and wicked and cruel people because of the history of imperialism. Mm -hmm. which I think um, you know, sometimes it's based on a rather peculiar uh, view of British imperialism, but other times I think it is just based on, like you're saying, this inflated view of a tiny slot of British history where very, very peculiar circumstances applied that allowed the British um, to, to seize this global role. So, yeah, and there are a lot of reasons why it is a sort of negative and bad thing. But I, I think you're also right, it's not entirely so. Um, that uh, I think it doesn't hurt a country to have sort of myths that hold the country together. In fact, I think it can be a very, very positive thing, as long as they don't encourage you to go really crazy. Um, so these myths can, up to a point, be a really positive thing. And I think one of the problems the British Isles currently have is that the myths holding them together as British are not super strong. I mean, they don't really go back more than two or 300 years um, that, to this period of the British imperialism and global dominance. And in some ways, the myths of Englishness, Scottishness, Irishness, Welshness, those myths are a lot stronger. And um, I do think just economically and in the security perspective, it would probably be a bad idea for the British Isles to break up. But um, the, the sense of Britishness, isn't very strong. At least that's my perception of you know, spending a lot of time in Britain. Just like the sense of Europeanness was just so very weak um, under the EU. So I was curious, what's your own conception of British identity? Like when you think of what it means to be British, not specifically English, but British, mm -hmm. what is, you know, I guess you just as a case study yourself, how do you conceive of it? Yeah, well, I think um, yeah, the, this vision of Britishness, uh, well, Englishness originally, and then it was sort of grown, <laughs> sure. extended, so you know, the Scots, Welsh, and Irish um, honorary <laughs> extension. Um, this, this vision of Britishness got built up of the well, the English and then the British as this particularly polite nation, in the sense that they used that word politeness back in the 18th century, uh, which was in reaction to um, what they call the enthusiasms of the 17th century. You know, enthusiasms meaning like the, the sort of passions that would 
lead you to burn people at the stake for having religious differences that most of us nowadays can't even figure out what the differences were. I mean, they're, they're so technical. Um, but yet that can cause you to be burned at the stake. And we are going to kill each other in huge numbers over um, what we see as the consequences of our um, English identity that again then so spills over into the rest of the British Isles as well. And so in the, in the 18th century, um, a lot of the top people in English society, the people who have most to lose from a return to violence, are saying, we kind of don't care what we have to do, but we are not going back to that world. Come what may, we will not go back to that world. And like the, the political differences between Whigs and Tories in the early 18th century are really bitter and really deep. But it's like when push comes to shove, the ruling class always closes round. They will always agree to read the Riot Act out and shoot everybody who's giving them trouble because they will not divide internally and go back to war with each other the way they did in the 17th century. And I think in some ways this has had fairly long term and fairly deep consequences for this British sense of identity. So I think it, it definitely is open to question whether the British really are as reasonable and balanced as they like to tell everybody they are and um, things like brexit make you wonder <laughs> are they really yeah, sure. are. and of course the, the the other side of the politeness thing again going all the way back to the 18th century has been that there's always had to be like these safety valves and uh, ways that people can blow off steam and be absolutely not polite people and so you know, something like in my lifetime, um, the soccer football hooliganism, which is something that to almost everybody in the entire rest of the planet, this is inexplicable that you know, the British are so you know, comically polite and bending over backwards ever to cause offence to anybody, at least this is their perception themselves, and then they will beat each other to death over two football teams based their grounds here two miles apart. What can possibly explain sure. This is a sort of long-term Britishness thing. And so I think that is an important part of Britishness, not necessarily being reasonable, but thinking of yourself as a very reasonable person. Mm -hmm. That has a lot, of, a lot of different consequences. And uh, some historians, and I think they're partly right about this, will say that, um, you know, one of the things historians can often agree on is you know, what causes World War II, it's Adolf Hitler. That if you took Hitler out of the equation, then you're probably not going to get a war in the late 1930s. You're certainly not going to get the war that you did get in the late 1930s. But some British historians will say, well, actually, it's not entirely Hitler's fault. I mean, it is almost entirely, but not quite entirely. And the British political class bear a little bit of the responsibility here, just because they were so damn British. That, um, yeah, after, accommodating, I suppose, right? Exactly, yeah, after, yeah, after World War I, um, put together this Treaty of Versailles, this kind of boxes Germany into this corner, and the Germans protest loudly, this is unfair and unworkable, you know, cruel and punitive treaty. And a lot of people in the British educated classes agree with them about this. And in fact, a lot of historians now will say the Treaty of Versailles was either too soft or too hard. And the problem was it, it should have been in somewhere in the middle, um, but uh, or, or somewhere to the extremes. Um, but uh, a lot of people in the 20s and 30s started agreeing with the Germans over this, saying we do need to accommodate the Germans, do need to give ground to them. And um, a lot of members of the British leadership were bending over backwards to persuade themselves that the Hitler faction, the Hitler regime was reasonable as well and could be reasoned with and had reasonable goals and didn't want a war, wanted to find ways to get what they wanted without plunging Europe into war. And British bend over and bend over and bend over to accommodate this vision until Hitler, who in some ways was a perfectly reasonable man, in other ways not, but some ways was, like any reasonable diplomat concludes, there is no issue over which the British and French will go to war. I can keep pushing my claims and pushing them. They're never actually going to go to war, which is not the way the British are seeing it. It's the British, I think, were seeing it that we are being entirely reasonable here. In fact, we have been reasonable beyond what could reasonably be expected. And there is, in fact, a line out there. And if the Germans cross that, then because we are so reasonable, 
and they have offended against us so wickedly, there is now no limit to what we are justified in doing to them. And we will rain fire on their cities from the skies. We will burn their children in their beds. We will destroy them forever. Churchill talked about strewing anthrax spores across the whole of Germany. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly reasonable because they have transgressed against reasonableness so badly. So I mean, it can have these rather... This vision of ourselves as the reasonable people can have alarming side effects. And I find this with myself sometimes with my colleagues at Stanford. I feel I'm bending over. I've been so damn reasonable. <laughs> and you have refused to be reasonable. So now it's OK for me to do whatever I want. now. So, yeah, it's not always a good thing. Sure. That, that's that's very interesting, actually. And, uh, you and know, one of the... yes, that's... <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> one of the follow up questions to that is how much do you how much of of the different national identities do you think are sort of founded in historical ignorance? Because, as you say, if you look more closely, if you look on a longer time scale, you realize that a lot of the things that I think a lot of people identify as more cohesive and more just sort of frankly true are not so you know, maybe just a lack of, of knowledge on topics of the past is leading us to many of the issues we have today. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very easy to conclude that um, the, the the people who you might be arguing with, especially if they're in another country, uh, there's no, no rational justification for what they want. They are just either stupid or wicked or both of the above. There are all kinds of other things as well. And um, that can be a, a huge problem. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's something like you know, the Russians invading Ukraine. I mean, one of the things that I think is actually a little bit alarming in the Western press coverage of that is this assumption of, oh, clearly Vladimir Putin has just lost his mind. This is the only explanation for what he's doing. He's lost his mind. Mm -hmm. And um, that, I think, if you know anything about Russian history, you know, well, that's obviously not the case. Putin is not an aberration from the several hundred years now of Russian leaders in doing what he's doing. But um, you, know, you look long-term in Russian history, when, when Moscow first starts becoming a serious player back in about the 14th century, um, all of its real enemies are to the east, these Mongol warlords um, threatening Moscow from the east. And they are like existential threats to the city's existence. But they eventually they get the better of the, the Mongols. By the 16th, 17th centuries, the Russians really pushed the Mongols back um, off the stage. At that point, all of a sudden, all the threats to the Russians are coming now from the West. And so like in 1610, the Poles burn Moscow. 1705, the Swedes besiege St. Petersburg. 1812, Napoleon burns Moscow again. 1917, the Germans break up the whole of Russia. 1941, 42, the Germans almost do this again. Yet you would have to be a very naive Russian leader not to look West and say, oh, crap, those guys are scary. And so for 400 years now, one of the big Russian strategic agendas has been push that frontier as far to the West as possible, because Westerners are more powerful than us. They're richer, more sophisticated. Their militaries are more deadly. Our only weapon is distance. So a lot of distance, so the winter sets in, makes it hard for them to operate. This is a life and death issue for us. And this, this, is, because this is what Putin meant when he came out with this, what seems like such an outrageous line about the collapse of the Soviet Union being the greatest geopolitical disaster mm -hmm. of the century. What he means is that it has undone three, four hundred years of Russian grand strategy, pushing that frontier westward. And now we're in a pickle. And so I think any Russian leader, like even you know, if uh, Alex Navalny got sprung from prison and becomes leader now in Russia, Navalny is also going to look at the map and say, we've got to do something about Ukraine. We can't have a country that big, so close to Moscow, just about four or five hundred kilometers away, whatever it is, can't have that um, being in NATO being in the European Union, this is not good. And we've got to do something about it. Because what they don't have to do is decide, well, the something is invade them. That is not necessarily- sure. But the, something, but something. Strategically, any Russian leader is going to think this way. And if you understand anything about Russian history, you will not want to say that Putin is mad. And saying Putin is mad, I think it sets you up with this rather foolish notion that well we just get rid of Putin regime change the next guy is going to be just fine sure. the next guy is not going to be just fine no, no. and this is all concerned this is a very conservative line to take but like uh, when the Bolsheviks overthrew the czars in 1917 all the conservatives said 
they are no different. This is still Russia. It's not like it's become the Soviet Union. It's different. No, it's not. It's still Russia. And then when the Soviets fall in the 1990s, all the conservatives say, oh, this is still the Soviet Union. Nothing has changed. Different guys, sure. But they're all the damn same. Going right back to Ivan the Terrible, Russians are all the same, which is you know, an extreme way to put it. But you, you could say their geography has not changed. The same questions are being thrust onto them now as they were in the 17th century. And um, I think just your know, understanding a little bit more about different parts of the world helps you you see things this way. And I think on the whole, one of the things I've learned from writing these books is that our political leaders are not as stupid as they sometimes make themselves look. Because uh, sometimes you know, it's very much in their interest to say, oh yes, sure. Vladimir Putin, wicked man, political uh, advantage to me in projecting this image. <laughs> Whereas I found when you start burrowing into these things as a historian, you pretty quickly see that most of the top players did understand a little bit more about what was going on. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so I think we, there's uh, time for probably one more question before I'll let you go. Um, I guess I'd like to end where you ended in the book, uh, talking about quite literally the last few lines of the book, where you're visiting your hometown and you see a street vendor and you pick up a coffee mug, turn it over and see it was made in China. But notably, you put it back down and you walk away. Yes. So I just kind of wanted to hear a sort of an expansion on that. Was that sort of your your means of imparting your own opinion on where the West should go? Sort of because I, I sort of interpreted it as prioritizing community identity and so on over economic prosperity alone. But mm. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Because yeah, since the book came out, I've done quite a lot of interviews and stuff, and nobody has asked this. Really? <laughs> Sort of makes me think that none of them would actually. It felt to... very pointed, so I'm surprised at that. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, it makes me think maybe they didn't get to the end of the book. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I throughout the book, I try to take the sort of long-term historian, geostrategic overview of what's going on, and and say that um, what what is happening now with the rise of China feels like this sort of you know, unprecedented threat to Western identity and sovereignty and security and prosperity, and all these other things. But of course, in so many ways it is. It's just the latest version of the long, this long-term story of wealth and power shifting from place to place around the world. People constantly having to make decisions about what is in our best interest to do about this. And you know, one of the lines I quote several times in my book is that wonderful Lord Palmerston thing about how the British people have no eternal friends and no perpetual uh, allies or something like that. We just have eternal and perpetual interests, you know, which, which is why end of the 19th century, the British drop their longtime friends, the Germans, and side with their longtime enemies, the French and Russians, and to a lesser degree, the Americans, because they're taking this very cold, hard look at what's really going on and saying, it might hurt us to do this, might hurt us to have a liberal government to side with autocratic czarist regimes. This is painful, hard for conservatives to side with socialist Frenchmen, but it's painful, but we got to do this um, because this is what, what needs to be done. And so in the main part of the book, I do try to leave this as an open question. This is the challenge on the table now. What is the best thing to do in a world that is tilting toward China? And I don't have the answers. Nobody has the answers. And anybody tells you they do is either a liar or a fool or both. Uh, you know, I don't have the answers. But of course, I still do have opinions. And so, yeah, I mean, going to back to Stoke in 2017. And actually, one thing I worried about with ending the book with this anecdote was that, I mean, it's going to seem like so perfect that people will think I made it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, sure. It did actually happen. And you know, I looked at this little cup, this little cup with a picture of a, a pot bank on it. You know, this sort of classic motif of Stoke on Trent, the city where all the pottery makers were based. Looks like they're, oh, that's kind of nice. I'll take that home. And they look, it says made in China on the bottom. And without thinking at all, just completely unconscious, just put it down, head it off. Wasn't going to do that. And yeah, I realized, well, this is sort of where I am on these issues. And perhaps it would have been the same for me in the 1890s when the British are talking about making this alliance with the ancient enemy, the French. Maybe I would have been the same kind of guy. When it comes to it, I don't want to do that. And I understand that, yes, the way the global order is changing, maybe the best thing financially for the British Isles and for lots of other parts of the world is to cozy up 
to the Beijing regime. Maybe the entire global order, because of that, is going to shift toward a security system dominated by the Chinese. Um, maybe our governmental systems increasingly are going to come to resemble the way China runs itself, or at the very least be ones that can be accommodated within China's view of the rest of the world. And maybe strategically in the long run, this is the best thing for people in the British Isles, in the whole of the Western world. Maybe this is the best thing to do, but I still don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. That was kind of where that little story was coming from. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. And obviously, I, I frankly tend to agree. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people who tend to agree as well. So, and again, uh, yeah, I, I just the follow up for one second, because yeah, of course. the thing is with these things, when you try to put that together with the larger strategic visions, um, you do at a certain point have to you, you end up asking, well, how much do I think this? Do I think we should have no truck with Chinese autocracy if it means burning Taiwan to a crisp? Do I think we should hold this attitude if it means burning New York City to a crisp? Um, maybe I think a certain point, I think that I, I like to think that historians should never say inevitable, never say you have no choice in something. You always have a choice. We are all, we're creatures, I think we've evolved to be animals that are very good at responding to incentives and costs and benefits. And I think we are shockingly flexible uh, over these things that we feel so very, very deeply and strongly. But, but yeah, it, it, is, it is a difficult thing to wrestle with. Yeah, for sure. Well, again, really, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time.